أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ربي أنتكنا بالهدى وألهمنا التقوى السلام عليكم everyone ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. I pray all of you are well, inshallah. Um, and I want to welcome each and every one of you uh, to the eighth year, alhamdulillah, of Jafri Online Institute or shortened to joy. Uh, it's really a blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal that He has allowed us to continue for this long, um, and to you as well for your desire to want to study and want to improve yourselves um, to get to become better servants of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Uh, being the first class, just to go over the general rules or the general methodology of this class, it'd be nice if attendance kept up. Um, but alhamdulillah, it's a 12-week course and we understand life happens, but this is why we record the sessions and they're available for those who have signed up. Um, the general breakdown for those who have been with this course is 40 to 45 minutes of explanation of the text, and then we open it up for questions. We would really like the questions to be of this material, and as always, um, more times than not, I don't have the answers, and so we are growing and learning uh, with each other. Um, you, re you require a lot of patience for this course. The material is super dense. Uh, it's a slow burn. And so we try to dissect it the best way that we can and explain it the best way that we can. Um, just the previous book that we did, 40 Hadith, took us four years to finish. And so this is our second term, full term, second year of, of this book, Adab al Salah. Um, and so it's a slow burn and we're not trying to rush through it. And so we're going to go a section at a time. Um, and to maybe enhance the discussion, oftentimes material from other sources is added so that we can uh, grow from that. Um, that's just the introduction. Um, before we continue, I do this in the first class and the last class. Like Jaffrey Online Institute is only possible with the help of uh, some really dedicated volunteers. Um, so I want to just give them a shout out. Um, Brother Rehan Zaidi, uh, he does everything in the back end. So please uh, do dua, prayer for him. May Allah give him a long life, inshallah. But nothing would have been possible without Brother Rehan Zaidi. Uh, his daughter Fatima is the admin. She's running uh, any technical issues you may have. She's the one that you will reach out to when you contact the, the Zoom account, um, and Brother Muhammad Bakr Umwala, who used to be the admin uh, behind this, but uh, he's still an integral part of our team. Of course, we thank all our families for supporting us and being patient with us. And so to get that out of the way now, alhamdulillah, um, let's get into uh, the course. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the book, as we know, is uh, Adab al-Salah. And the book Adab al-Salah um, is broken up into three main uh, categories, or three main sections. Um, discourse, I think it's Discourse 1, Discourse 2, and Discourse 3. So Discourse 1, discourse one uh, was the general uh, internal disciplines that are required for us to improve the quality of our Salah. So disciplines such as tranquility, submissiveness, presence of heart, curing the wandering imagination. Alhamdulillah, we finished that last year. So that was like the first section of the book. And as I said, for those who are new, all the recordings have been sent to you. So you can um, listen to them. But you don't need that material to understand this material. The second discourse is regarding the, the muqaddamat or the preliminary requirements of prayer. And he, he breaks it down, uh, obviously, with the inner dimensions. He doesn't, con he doesn't uh, concentrate or spend any effort talking about the ahkam 
or the laws of these things, right? Like that's another place where you can find them. Um, and so in this discourse, there are things, he, he breaks it up into five sections, which are the purity of purity, tahara, clothing, time, uh, the place of salah and qibla. And we are still in objective one, which is the purification. Um, and then the third discourse is on specific acts that we do in the prayer, like sa'adhan and iqama and qiyam and ruku and sujood and I'm not sure when we'll get to that, to be quite honest. May Allah give us long enough life for that. Um, and so we covered the first, the cha purification is broken up, I think it is seven chapters. We covered the first four chapters last year. Um, but I, I will, today what I want to spend it on is the, is the summary of those four chapters, because we need, we need some of that to move on forward. And it's going to be new, even if you attended last year um, and so let's today is a, is a summary of chapters one through four and then inshallah next week we'll start chapter five and move on from that so let's start um, with what the author says so one of the things or one of the main points that the author um, repeats throughout this book is that the state of salah has an external dimension and these external dimensions basically have their own set of guidelines and discipline, right? So the external dimensions are those things which are covered in the books of fiqh about how to pray, um, about how the rules of prayer, what to say when, what not to say, what not to do. So these are the external dimensions of prayers. And it's these external dimensions of prayers that gets us to like the first stage of qubuliya, right? Or the first stage of acceptance. This is like the ritual stage of acceptance. If we just reach this station, I think it has merit on its own, right? Uh, but reaching this station alone does not bring about the effects that these actions could bring about. So, for example, when Allah Azza wa Jal says, that establish your prayer because prayer will prevent you from indecencies and wrong. When I just concentrate on the external dimensions of my prayer, I don't spiritually rise to the rank where now I am able to avoid uh, the muharramat and the, the vices and the fawahish that exist around me, right? So I may be a person who prays, but I still may be a person who dabbles into some things which I shouldn't. Um, and the reason why like, again, like there are traditions that tell us that too, right? Like if you want to gauge if your which level of acceptance your prayer is, or how much of your prayers are accepted, look to see how much you commit acts that are against what God wants. And oftentimes, a person will be a musalli, they will pray, um, but they will still do these things that are not accepted by God. And the reason being is that they've just concentrated or kind of limited themselves to the external dimensions. But the author says there are also internal dimensions, right? And the internal dimensions, just the way the external have their own principles and conditions, so do the um, external, uh, the internal dimensions. Uh, and he says that it's this, it's this. He doesn't say this, but this is the the understanding that it's this spiritual or internal dimensions that really end up separating one believer from the other. Right. So, like externally, like we're all praying, we're all rukuing, we're all all sujuding. Um, those aren't words, but you know what I mean? Like, so, but at the end of the day, what separates us is how much heart did we have? How much tranquility did we have? How many vices did we try to remove in the state of purification? And so, therefore, just as wudu is the purifier of the external essence of, of a human being, Similarly, there are internal purities that we have to undergo for that salah to reach its complete perfection. So the wudu is a reminder. Uh, it, it fulfills the external act, which is to wash ourselves, to be clean when we come to pray. But that external cleanliness is supposed to remind us to clean our inside, right? to clean our hearts, to clean our ourselves. And so there, that is... A purpose to the external, but at the same time, it's also there to ignite the internal, right? Um, and the author now says that 
Thus, purification has also its outer form and formal disciplines, the explanation of which is beyond the scope of these pages. The faqis or the scholars have explained them. As far as the inner dimensions, he continues, it should be noted that the reality of the salah is ascension to the proximity and reaching the presence of Allah, the Almighty. Thus, to attain this great objective, getting closer to God, um, and the ultimate goal, one should practice certain purifications which are other than the outer purification. So basically, you cannot think that you are going to ascend to God, which is a spiritual ascension, while just looking after the physical dimension of your prayer. Right? So the physical dimension fulfills the dunyawi purpose, but that spiritual ascension has to come from the spirit, it has to come from the soul. And so it's a reminder that we have to purify ourselves. The thorns, he continues, of this road and the obstacles in the way of this ascension are such impurities that if the salik, one who journeys, were marked by one of them, he would be incapable of ascending to the peak and completing the ascension. And so this point, again, is something not to be defeating, but basically there are, uh, let's just say, out of like a random number, let's say there are 12 impurities along the way. And there are 12 stations reaching God. We're just making these numbers up, right? If I have any one of these impurities, it's going to prevent me from reaching that top level. And so the more impurities I have, the further away I am from that top level of proximity and closeness to Allah. And similarly, I may be 11 out of 12, and that's an amazing, amazing rank, but it's only the perfect ones who have reached that place. And this is why when we talk about our Prophet, and when Allah Azza wa Jal says to him, Sallallahu alayhi wa ali, dana fatadalla fakana qaba khawseinin, or adna, right? That, that you came close, and then you came even closer. That closeness to God that he attained was due to the perfection and the absolute cleanliness of the impurities of the spiritual realm that he was completely devoid of, right? And so, yes, that's reserved for those who are perfect, but that doesn't mean we don't try and aim higher, at least, at least get the knowledge of that these things exist, right? Such impurities, he continues, are the hindrances in the way of salah and the plagues of, the, of shaitan. The traveler to Allah has first to remove the obstacles and impurities so that he may be purified and attain purity, which belongs to the world of light. Unless all impurities, outer and hidden, open and hidden, are outer and inner, open and hidden, are purified, the one who journeys will have no chance of attending this presence of God, this, this hudur, right? Now, again, we're talking about a spiritual realm here, right? the spiritual realm where I, I feel connected to God. I feel close to God. The reason sometimes we may not feel this way, you know, it's interesting, right? Like, so the reason sometimes we may feel distant to God is not because externally we are doing things which are haram, not like I'm eating something haram or listening to something haram, but there are spiritual vices that I have not cured that are preventing me from, from experiencing that hudur, that presence of God. And so it could be that maybe I'm a bit selfish. It could be that I'm a bit stingy. It could be that I'm a bit egoistic, whatever it is, right? Um, these things are hidden. And so because I don't see them, I don't pay much attention to them. But then when I feel a lack of connection to God, I may blame God at certain instances, like why doesn't he love me? Or I may blame other factors when it's in fact these spiritual matters that are preventing me from seeking closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal. So the first impurity that he discusses in chapters one through four, um, that he says thus the first kind of impurity is that of the outer instruments and powers of the soul which may be polluted with obstinances and acts of disobedience 
um, to the benefactor. This is an apparent snare of Iblis. As long as man is trapped in this snare, snare of what? Acts of disobedience, right? He is deprived of being in Allah's presence and attaining his proximity. No one may have that notion that without purifying the outside of his kingdom, he can reach the state of the truth of humanity or that he can purify his inner heart as this will be a satanic vanity and the Iblis's biggest tricks, right? Like one of the biggest tricks that Iblis plays is convincing us that this small sin that I'm doing is okay. It's not preventing me from getting closer to God. And he may even convince me to say, look how kind God is being with you. Uh, when in fact, like the, the fact of the matter is, it's impossible to get close to God, right? Um, or to be even invited within the sanctity of that closeness to God if I am engaging in acts which are forbidden, right? Acts of disobedience. And this is something that we have to fully grasp that it's impossible for me to be good with God to be close to God, uh, to be one of his friends, if I'm engaging in any acts of disobedience, right? I mean, that doesn't mean I have to be masoom, but in a general, very, very, um, like a basic state, like no, no one, no believer should be intentionally doing something haram, right? Be it the beard, be it the hijab, be it music, be it, uh, greed, be it, and greed may be an internal thing, but maybe hoarding, straf, wasting, whatever. But to intentionally do these things uh, and then not, and then think I'm close to God is one of shaitan's tricks, right? So at the very minimum where we have to get to, the, what the author is saying, um, is that we have to get to a point where we stop sinning. Right? Because that's the first impurity. Before we even get to the, the spiritual impurities, the first one is we have to stop sinning. He says this is because the heart's impurity and darkness will be increased by disobedience, which mark the triumph of nature over spirituality. The nature he's talking about here, so that it's the ghalaba, the, the nature overpowers the spirituality. The nature here, I think he translates it as tabiyah. Or he, he, he writes it as tabia. The tabia is like the physical essence, the physical world, what we see physically, tangibly. He says that as long as we're sinning, the physicality will always triumph over the spirituality, right? Unless the salik conquers the kingdom of the outside, he will remain dep deprived of the inner conquest. That's one of the big obstacles of this suluk, of this journey is the impurities of the acts of disobedience which must be purged and purified with the water of sincere repentance. So again, it's pretty cool how he connects water here uh, as, as a description of repentance, right? Where water serves as a purifying agent. Similarly, repentance is a purifying agent of the internal self, right? And so I like, I really like the basicness of this. The basicness meaning the, the clarity and the obviousness of it. So what we learn, right, like from this, from that first uh, disobedience, and again, like we're just summarizing today. This is not how we will generally go paragraph by paragraph mostly, but this is a summary. So what we summarize from the first impurity is that the primary condition towards spiritual cleanliness is to avoid sinning. That I cannot be spiritually uplifted, charged, uh, and especially uplifted and charged continuously. Like, I think I can get spiritually upcharged going for ziyarat. I can get spiritually upcharged helping someone. Um, but if that is immediately or very soon after countered with acts of disobedience, that charge is gone, right? That charge is gone. And then what we end up doing is we try to duplicate the charge, which is let's go for ziyarat again, let's go for ziyarat again, and I don't come back charged in that same way. Why? Because I haven't cleansed the other thing, right? like I haven't cleansed the disobedience. So the first condition we have is spiritual cleanliness is to avoid sinning. After or maybe while in the process of, of stopping to sin, I repent from Allah Azza wa Jal, 
Um, and with the realization also that I have to have is that every external scene that I engage in weakens the internal nature, right? Uh, and so the the, kuwa, the the strength internally to do things, to change, gets weakened every time I sin. This goes back to like the first hadith of the book 40 hadith when he talks about the two forces that exists within every human being. There is a satanic force and a divine force and they're constantly battling. And this is why we, we get into situations where we like, becomes very stressful, right? Like, well, should I, should I not? Should I watch this, should I not? And as long as that, that voice, that battle is there, alhamdulillah, because eventually one side overcomes, right? And I'll just watch or I'll just listen without even having anything telling me not to. Um, but this is something that, uh, what we have to realize is that the more I sin, the divine forces eventually get weakened. And so they don't even have a voice to tell us not to do something anymore because the satanic forces grow so powerful, right? Um, and so every sin makes the divine forces weaker. They strengthen the satanic forces. It destroys our willpower, right? Um, and eventually it extinguishes the light that God has given us, the light that the aim Maybe extinguish is the wrong word. I'm not sure if the light of Fitra ever gets extinguished, but it, but it can get so rusted that the light never shines again, right? Um, and so that's the summary of the first type of impurity. As far as the second impurity that we have to journey to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal is to cleanse the impurity of corrupt morality, nature, and disposition, like who I am as a person, right? Um, the author says that this is the second kind of impurity, which is more corrupt and more difficult to cure. And thus, it is more important to the people of austerity, because as long as the inner moralities of the soul are corrupt and encircled by spiritual impurities, it will not deserve the state of holiness um, and private place of intimacy as the origin of the corruption of the exterior kingdom of the soul is its corrupt morals and vile habits. And unless the Salik changes these vile habits to good ones, he will not be safe from the evil acts externally. Right? Um, if he is successful in repentance while still having vile habits, its stability, which is a matter of grave importance, cannot be achieved. And so the outer purification depends on the inner purification, besides the fact that the inter interior impurities cause deprivation of happiness and originate the hell of morals, which as the people of knowledge say is worse and more intense and burning than the hell of deeds. Amazing, um, lots to unpack, right? Like from these two paragraphs, but really cool what he said. Uh, but let's unpack it in just a little bit more clarity. So what exactly is he saying? So from this discussion, we learned that after we have worked um, on our external nature, so trying to prevent haram, stop doing things in haram. And so I reached this point where at least now, alhamdulillah, I'm not a person who sins purposely. Right? I always say purposely because we're not masu. But I, I'm a person who doesn't sin purposely. Um, and how I do that, so like one way obviously is by creating punishments, but that's something else. Our next responsibility after this is to work on the internal nature, which is the fountainhead of external actions. Um, what that means is that as long as my internal nature is not healed and cleansed, it will continue to promote, uh, encourage, it will continue to tempt for me to re-engage in those acts that I had done before, right? Um, and so I may be able to stop sinning, but the voice to sin is always there. Why? Because I haven't cleaned my internal nature. And eventually, if that voice is always there, always there, uh, many a human being will end up cracking, right, and and fall victim to that, and and so they may relapse into sin. They may once again 
engage in something that they really didn't want to engage in. But the reason why they have this hard time fighting off these, these temptations is because the internal nature hasn't been purified. So as long as my ex internal nature is not purified, the chances of me re-engaging in sin are always going to be there. We also understand from this discussion is that purifying the internal um, nature is is dip, is more difficult than purifying the external nature of the human being, right? Um, and I think there are many reasons for this. Like the external can be convinced or it can be trained to do something. So I can program my day where I don't have time within that day to do the haram thing that I wanted to do. Like I can create a schedule, I can, um, I can train myself to leave something because the, at the end of the day, the human being is a creature of, of habit, right? And if I can figure out a way of breaking the habit of what I'm doing for a period of time, then to go back to that habit um, is not something that will be automatic. The temptation will be there, right? That's why they say, um, when it comes to like uh, drugs and alcohol and, and rehabilitation, they say once an addict, always an addict, right? Um, but that doesn't mean you're going to do it, but you can, ease, you can easily relapse, right? Um, but the external can be trained, right? So the, so the external is something that we can learn and program ourselves and, and train ourselves to avoid, but to get the internal nature awakened, it requires a lot more, like a lot more work for me to stop uh, thinking negatively, for me to stop being selfish, for me to care more about other people, for me not to have the world revolve around my ego, for me to be more open-handed. All of these things like require a lot more commitment, right? Because now it's, we want these things to be naturally grown within us and to avoid the selfish and egoistic and, and, and I, I of the person, that's a lot more work to break, right? And so what we understand from this is that yes, that the first one can be done, the second one has to be done, but if I want to do the second one, I have to put in um, a lot more work. And this is where also I think um, like we struggle, right? So like externally, we all know how to pray really well, but internally we struggle. We're like, how come I can't get my concentration? How come I can't focus? How come I can't do all of these things? And the reason why is because the second thing that I'm looking for, you have to do a lot more work, more diligence, more effort, more, pro more probing, more, more, more consistency. Um, and honestly, like that can be draining, right? It's easier to pray without concentration than to concentrate, to concentrate in Salah, right? And that's draining at the end of it. But once we get it, like, it's like fireworks, like amazing, right? But we, we just have to have to get it. And that's the work that we have to put in. But also what we understand from this, from this write-up that the author is, has, has said is that most of our unpleasantness that we experience, our unhappiness, the discomfort that we feel like, ah, why, oh, this, that, stems um, from the internal nature not being purified. Like we may blame a lot of our difficulties on external things, right? Like I blame my, my unhappiness on my neighbor. I blame my unhappiness on my spouse or my children or on my in-laws or my, we tend to just point fingers and blame, 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 right? Um, but the reality of the matter is that um, the, the problem exists internally as far as like external problems, right? Like be it people related, be it poverty, illness, be it death, be it whatever, this is how this world works. Okay, like the, the quicker I can get awakened to the fact that this is how dunya functions, um, I just have to learn how to overcome my internal self 
so that I don't get so easily affected by how dunya works, right? And so I learn and I process and I develop things like satisfaction. I develop things like trust or gratefulness and hope and all of these positive qualities. And these qualities really only become firmly rooted when I can remove the negative things of mistrust and, and, and pessimism and rancor and greed and all of these things. You can't have satisfaction and rancor at the same time, right? And so unless I pull out these negative things, that's the only way positive things will come in. But once they do, then my entire nature changes. Right? Like I worry less. I think, I think more positive. I have more hope. I have all of these things. Um, and so this is something that we have to strive for um, diligently to purify that secondary form of impurity. Now we come to chapter three. So those were the first two chapters. In the chapter three, he quotes a lengthy tradition from our sixth Imam Ali Salam, which describes water as a mercy from God. He says, when you in the sixth Imam Ali Salam is reported to have said that when you intend purification and wudu, proceed to the water as you proceed to Allah's mercy. Because Allah has made water the key to his proximity and supplication. Like it's pretty cool, right? Like, so how would you come to God's mercy? Like if I really need something, right? like I would beg God, I would attend, I would come to sujood with my family, Ya Allah, I need you, Ya Allah, I need you. He's saying, come to do the wadu like this, where you come to it realizing that this is a form of mercy given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah has made this water, this purification as a key to the proximity to him. That means that salah that is my spiritual ascension has no acceptance without wudu. Now obviously there are circumstances, whatever, we're not focusing on that. But that wudu is the key. Okay? That gets me closer to Allah azza wa jal and a guide to the court of his service. Just as Allah's mercy purifies the sins of the servants, when I come to God begging for his mercy, he purifies and by cleansing away that sin. And similarly, he says, the outer impurities are purified by water and nothing else. So as he has given life through water to everything of the blessings of the world, likewise, he has made obedience the life of the hearts out of his mercy and grace. This was a really cool section. You, like you, we'll give a summary to the, I don't know how much the summary covers, but this was a, a nice lecture where he, um, where the author does like a really good interpretation of this. You can check it out in, in the list you were given. He says, then mix with the creatures of Allah, like the mixture of water with things. It gives to everything is due without any change in its own meaning. SubhanAllah. And learn a lesson from the messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him and his family, who says, a sincere believer is like water. Really cool, yeah, like really cool. Like, um, like we attribute this quote to Bruce Lee, and he, where he says, be like water. But SubhanAllah, the Prophet said that 1400 years ago, he said a believer should be like water. Right? And let your own purity, the Imam says, with Allah, the Most High, be like the purity of water, as he sent it down from the sky and called it a purifier. Therefore, cleanse your heart with the fear of Allah and certitude, and you cleanse your or the way you cleanse your organs with water. So let's just quickly explain this. So in this tradition, he describes water um, as the manifestation of the mercy of Allah, right? Like it is a form of mercy from which he creates everything. And so as the author said that according to the people of knowledge, God's mercy as a whole can be described as water. So again, like this is an analogy to the mercy of God is described as water. Okay. Ma or Rahma or whatever it is, but they attribute the word water to God's mercy. The reason being is that because just as water has the ability to purify physical impurities, the mercy of Allah has the ability of purifying 
creates dual impurity. So this is a very beautiful way, right? Like of understanding, like in a practical sense, like how Allah has created purifying agents, right? Like in the material world, water is the purifying agent, right? Like there are other mutahharat we know, but nothing works like water. Even earth only cleans the bottom of your feet. The sun only cleans the side of the house or the door. Um, Inqilab changes things, but the only agent of purification really um, is water, right? Um, and from this as well, not only does it purify uh, one from impurities, but similarly water helps things grow, right? Um, water mixes with other things and allows it to blossom, right? Um, and these things as well allows the human being ability to attain proximity to Allah. So I use this water as an impurity, as a cleanser to my physical impurity. And through that now taharat or cleanliness that I have, it allows me to grow and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so from a physical world or a material world, this water purifies and allows me to grow. And similarly, in the spiritual world, mercy, forgiveness, love, all serve as purifying agents. Okay? And similar to physical water, these agents can purify our spiritual najasa. So the mercy of God purifies my spiritual najasa. The, the forgiveness of God spirit purifies my, my spiritual uncleanliness. And similarly, these things can help me grow closer to God. So like the, this mercy can purify and help me connect to God. This love can purify and help me connect to God. And so these purifying agents, both from a physical and a spiritual world, both have this dual functionality of number one, purification, and number two, growth, right? So this long tradition that we went through, it teaches us like the main points. And again, like I said, a lot more detail is given in that particular chapter uh, in that lecture, but here are some of the main points, right? That just as water purifies our physical impurities, we must reflect on purifying our spiritual impurities. Number two, just as water mixes with everything, we too have to mix with everything without corrupting the purity of our essence. And so water remains water, but water will go into the soil and allow a tree to grow or a plant to, to become bigger. Um, similarly, it doesn't lose its purity. And so we have a responsibility to mix and, and be social beings in this world, but without allowing the external factors to pollute my internal being. And so I have to learn how to navigate this world without having the external world um, influence and corrupt me, right? And then so I had to learn to be like water. Similarly, just as water is pure, we must learn to keep our hearts pure from anything that will in distance, distance ourselves from Allah. And the way hearts are purified is through taqwa and yaqeen. And then I think we spent some time on that. Finally, we come to chapter four which he now discusses the second purifying agent, which is earth. So the first purifying agent was water. And the way we tap into that purity is by uh, tapping into the forms of mercy of, that stem from Allah Azza wa Jal. Here, you know, like, just, just as there's a second purifying agent, uh, similarly, the author is saying that there are two ways of journeying towards, of journeying towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The primary way is to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and be drowned in the mercy of God. So we said the first was a purifying agent of water, which is understood as being in a spiritual world, mercy. Mercy is water. And so the first way of journeying towards Allah azza wa jal is by submitting and drowning ourselves in the mercy of God. We talked about this last time, and I don't want to repeat it, that I know at times when we look at the world that we live in, we may ask the question that where is this infinite mercy that we are talking about, right? Um, and I think there are two ways of answering this question. Number one is it's important for us to, to self-reflect 
to find the mercy of God in our lives rather than looking at someone else's life to sort of find where that mercy is. Because we will never understand that. But when we would look at our own lives, um, we just have to be honest and, 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 and see that no matter what we're going through, I'm still enveloped in the mercy of God. I may not have wealth, but alhamdulillah, I have health. I may not have health, but alhamdulillah, I have religion. I have safety. I have security. I have so many things. And so we're all in some way drowning in the mercy of God. Sometimes we just have to appreciate that. And so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that I know that we're saying don't look at the lives of others, but it's hard not to look at the lives of others. But we also have to understand that divine system necessitates that even those who are going through what we may refer to as difficulty, their lives would also be um, the, their, the divine system necessitates that even for those people, they are the benefactors of some form of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This is a, like a principle that God stamps on himself, that I am Rahman and Rahim. And so it's impossible then for any entity not to be experiencing that form of mercy. What that looks like, I don't know, right? For some, uh, it may be revised expectations. Right? For others, it may be greater appreciation for the blessings. I don't know if you saw this video like of a lady whose like neighborhood was just bombed in the West Bank. And so the reporter was asking her, like she was sweeping, but she was sweeping with like this huge smile on her face. And they're asking her, like, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, the neighborhood is just bombed. And she's like, aren't you upset? She's like, alhamdulillah, like our lives are still better than the people in Gaza, for example. Now they're living under occupation, really, but their expectations are different. They appreciate the blessings. I think similarly, if we would look at videos and, and talk to people in Gaza, like their faith would be hung, right? But whatever it is, like the expectation is that we don't look at other people. And if we do, we don't judge, right? Um, and of course, like the greatest blessing we have is, is deen, is religion, right? And so immerse yourself in the mercy in God. And like the more we accept God's mercy, the more purified our existence becomes because I don't then look at others. I just look at God. Right now, I think my life is not sufficient enough. And so I'm trying to, to fill it with other things. When God says, focus on me, if you focus on him, if we focus on him, then it begins to purify my environment and it purifies my heart and my mind. However, um, whatever the reason is that like due to negligence, apathy, laziness, or if we do not or cannot utilize the benefits that we are supposed to, which is zoning ourselves in the mercy of God, forgiveness of God, love of God, all of these things which are purifying agents, the author said, or suggests we try the second way of journeying towards God, where he says, should his hand become short of it because of inertia or negligence and be, and be bereaved of the water of mercy, he should have but to pay attention to his own humility, indigence, poverty, and destitution. Any person who reflects and thinks about their condition will recognize their inherent neediness. It doesn't matter how well off we are, how healthy we are, or how powerful we are. Inevitably, right, we will be in need of something, right? Um, those who are well, uh, who are well off will become ill. Um, if I live long enough, my body will start breaking down on me. Eventually, I, even though I may live in a world where I don't feel needy, eventually the need will be experienced. And when I look around that, the sooner we accept that need and recognize that no one can fulfill that need except for the one who is needless, Allah Azza wa Jal, we will then enter into this form of um, journeying towards God, where now my neediness for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, increases, right? And so I think this is a really beautiful point where we talked about how to learn from water, 
and be like water so that we can receive God's mercy. Here he teaches us that how to gain God's mercy is by changing our nature to be like the second purifier earth. Earth is something that is considered low, considered simple, considered not dirty necessarily, but very plain, very simple. Similarly, we have to strip away the pride and the ego and the self-love that, that, that shrouds us and become simple like the earth, become something essential back to our, by ourselves. And this is why, you know, like, subhanAllah, like why our first imam, and again, this is just the supervision, but like why he was proud to be known as Abu Turab, yeah? like the father of dirt. Because dirt in itself is, is free from anything arrogant. And he was free from anything arrogant, right? Um, and so we have to learn to become free from arrogance, right? And that this allows us uh, to achieve closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but, but at the same time, just like something which purifies, not only is itself pure, but it purifies others around them. And this is why the Ahlul Bayt were who they were. They were purifying agents and they purified everything else that was around them. Now, these are the two journeys that he talks about. And imagine one who is able to, to engage or encapsulate both of these. It's pretty cool, right? Um, so this is the summary of the first four chapters. And inshallah, if Allah Azza wa Jal gives us life, uh, we will continue or start from chapter five of the book um, next week. وآخر دعوان عن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآله محمد.